Hello everyone, welcome back to the AAS YouTube channel and this one goes down the AAS publishing uh, playlist on publishing in the AAS journals as an author 2021 edition. So this was actually the very first video that I posted on this YouTube channel, but it's good to uh, revisit it uh, to keep it fresh and because uh, things change and so you want to keep things up to date. You can also do this video as um, from the perspective of a referee, which I've done, and we'll put a link in the description below the video for that one. And you can also do it as a, uh, from the perspective as an editor, which I haven't published yet, but I will in due time. So let's get on with this one on publishing in the Double Edge Journals as an author. And to be clear on which journals I mean, I mean the AJ, Astronomical Journal, APJ, Astrophysical Journal, APJ Letters, APJ Supplement, Research Notes, the BAAS, the Bulletin of the AAS, and our newest journal, the Planetary Science Journal. So these are the journals that I'm talking about. They all have their little different flavors. Research Notes is slightly different, BAAS is slightly different, but in general, um, these are the journals that we'll be talking about as we go. So, <clears throat> our journals specialize in manuscripts presenting significant new results it's going to keep coming up through this talk, significant new results, on astronomical observations or theory applied directly to astrophysical systems. Uh, so this might look like boilerplate to you, um, but it's not. Uh, in fact, it has kind of remarkable brevity for what it does and what it does not say. Okay, So one of the things does, it does not say <coughs> is that we only publish correct results. It's not the Journal of Correct Results. Okay? Significant new results uh, is the primary metric for publication, in part because we don't know or what's going to be true five years from now, and so um, we can't publish just correct results because we don't know if that's correct results. So significant new results applied directly to astrophysical systems. And this is actually in the uh, letter that we send to referees, and we'll talk a little bit about referees when we get there, does the article contain significant new results or theories, and does it reflect sufficiently high scientific standards to warrant publication in the AAS journals? So one, your article must report a major new advance or a new approach, significant new results. Okay? But this also means that we don't publish comment articles and we don't publish review articles. Okay? So you can certainly comment on other articles by putting when you put your work in context, but your article itself must present significant new results. Incremental steps are not usually good enough. So for example, adding one object to a previous survey or surveys or accumulation of about a thousand objects is usually not a major new result. But there are exceptions. So, for example, finding Earth 2.0 would only be one object, uh, but it would be a significant new result. Um, so, that's one example. And the article should be set in context of previous research by yourself and others. And we'll come back to this when we get to that point. Okay. So, I want to talk about the elements of an article uh, that goes into a AAS journal article. And so scientific writing is a process involving at least two stages. One is thinking and planning about what you're going to write about, and then two is the actual act of writing and packaging result. The net, the goal, is to tell a convincing and well-woven science story. Your article is probably important to you. You are the invested author, and so you want to appreciate, respect, and engage your potential readers by putting a significant effort into effective communication to tell that well-woven science story. And part of this uh, appreciating and respecting is sort of in the vein of when in Rome, do as the Romans. And so you want to use the AAS uh, version, currently version six markup package. I've given the URL down below. So in other words, you want to put your article in the format that people will be expecting for a AAS journal. So if it looks like a AAS journal article, it will read like a AAS journal article, and it's one less barrier to um, telling that convincing and well-woven science story. 
So let's get into the elements of an article. The Great Gatsby. Okay, it's the title. The title is the most visible part of your article, and oftentimes it is the only item that is read by others. And so you want it to be short, accurate, and give a good idea of the main topic, The Great Gatsby. The title is also a source of information for indexing services such as uh, uh, ADS, the SAO NASA ADS, Astrophysical Data Systems, and other search engines. So let's talk about titles a little bit. The good, the bad, and the ugly, <clears throat> trendy, humorous titles. So good titles. The Crab Pulsar at Centimeter Wavelengths. Any question what that article is about? The C12 alpha gamma reaction rate and its implications for stellar helium burning. Pretty clear what you're going to be reading when you get into that one. The effects of dark matter annihilation on cosmic reionization. Very clear. Then we have the not so goods. Okay. Approaching the Kramer row bound with PDF symmetrization. Uh, I bet most people don't know what the Kramer row bound is, and we have an acronym in the title, PDF symmetrization, and why are we talking about portable document formats, PDF documents in a title? Ah, probability distribution function. Hmm, okay, probably should have written that one out. Okay, so acronyms generally you want to avoid. LAXPC reveals variability of GRS 1915 plus 105 in the sub-chi class. Woo! Okay, again, more acronyms in the title. Uh, and if you don't know what LAXPC is or what GRS means or a sub-chi class means, you're kind of lost on the title going in. Impulsively generated sausage waves with continuous structuring. Okay, um, why are we talking about sausages? <laughs> what is this? Uh, and what is continuous structuring? What is their discontinuous structuring? Um, so again, these are sort of uh, oblique on what the article is about, uh, and so not so great. Uh, and then we have, you know, the trendy, currently trendy, humorous type of titles. And a lot of these, you know, try and be cute up front, and then they colon, and then they put something a little bit more serious behind it. So, to infinity and beyond. You know, referencing a, a Disney movie, <clears throat> Buzz Lightyear, uh, too big to fail, referencing some uh, economic uh, calamity in the U.S. Uh, of not too long ago. Wait for it. Okay, again, sort of referencing a modern culture. And there are basically two reasons why you don't want to do a trendy, humorous type of title. Uh, number one, and I'll... Um, is there have been studies on the relative citation rates of articles that have more serious titles and articles that have trendy, uh, humorous, modern culture titles, um, and they generally are cited less. So I do have those. I will try and remember to put those in the link down below the video. So in other words, it's to your advantage, citation-wise, not to use a trendy, humorous article. And the second reason for it is, you're probably aware, if you're in the U.S., there are various um, legislative entities who take a certain pride in finding um, what they perceive as wasteful research uh, from the federal government, uh, if that's where you're funded from. Uh, and so you don't want to be called on that, and there have been cases in the past where things have been called up, and so you don't want to put uh, things like the AAS president or otherwise in the awkward position or you as an author trying to defend why your article is not a uh, frivolous waste of government resources. Okay, So please try and not use trendy humorous articles. They also may not wear well. Ten years from now they may not be so trendy or humorous. So be serious about your work. Right? If you can't be serious about your work, why should somebody else? Okay, So please don't do that. Uh, author names usually come next, and they are simple in principle, but nuanced in practice. So usually the first author has done the majority of the research and the writing, the second author has helped significantly with the entire project, and usually the remaining authors have played a key role in one or two aspects of the article. But many counter examples exist on this. Um, 
Sometimes people who do a significant amount to go last in the article or somewhere in the middle of the article. There's lots of variations on this. Okay, but I do want to bring up a AAAS policy. Is that uh, the lead author of the article, which need not be the first author on the article. Okay, usually the first author and the lead article are the one and the same, but it need not be. Um, examples would be when a graduate student is the first author, but the lead author is the one who receives all the communication about the article, uh, will be a senior author, the um, graduate student's advisor or something along those lines. So the lead author is obligated to ensure that all the co-authors agree to the content of the original submission and to any subsequent revisions. Okay, uh, you know, I have gotten articles where there were, uh, I don't know, a dozen or so authors <clears throat> so the manuscript was submitted and in one case it kind of stuck out i then got a subsequent email from uh half of the authors or at least you know around half of them uh claiming that you know they did uh not necessarily agree with some of what the other half of the authors had written um, okay, and then I got a subsequent email about two days later from that second half of the author saying uh, they don't necessarily agree with what the first half of the authors <laughs> were saying. And so, boot, you know, um, throw the flag. Uh, so I wrote them all, I wrote the lead author back and say, um, when all of the co-authors, pointing out this policy, when all of the co-authors agree on the content of the article, then I'll consider it for the peer review process. But until then, um, not dealing with this. So this goes for the original submission and any revision. You should always share any revision of the article with all your co-authors and get an explicit okay that they're okay with the changes and then move forward. Okay. Uh, let's see, what's another funny one uh, uh, on this one? Let's see, I've had articles submitted. <clears throat> um, fine. And so uh, I then start looking for a referee and I contact a potential referee and the potential referee goes, hey, I should have been on this paper. <laughs> I was on it originally. I don't know why I'm not on it now. <laughs> okay. Um, so that uh, pulled that one back, contacted the uh, lead author of the manuscript, asked about this and, oh, yes, that person should have been on it. Oops, my bad. Okay. Um, so that's another example. Uh, if people are on the paper, you should always communicate if they're going to be taken off the article um, and so on. Okay, so stay in communication with your co-authors. Uh, the abstract, it's like a good movie trailer. Nobody reads an article without first reading the abstract and often it's the only thing they read, the abstract, and so it's arguably the most important part of an article. And a good abstract invites a read of the full article. In that sense, it's like a, it's like a movie trailer. Uh, oftentimes you'll see a movie trailer and you decide whether you're going to watch the movie or not based on that trailer. Um, and so an abstract is much like that. You know, if you don't like the abstract, it's not speaking to you, you're probably not going to read the whole article. Um, and so you want to put uh, some good effort into that abstract to make the movie trailer good and encourage people to read your article. And so usually this good movie trailer is a sentence or two on the aim of the project give a few quantitative results in the abstract, and then a sentence or two on the meaning, the implication of the results, uh, how that relates to the big science questions that you're asking. And very commonly, uh, an abstract is the last part of a uh, manuscript that is written because you're trying to synthesize the whole thing. You're trying to come up with that great movie trailer to present to people. Uh, we do have a policy on abstracts that the abstract must be one paragraph and contain no more than 250 words. Um, and this policy came up because in not so distant past, you can go back and look at some of the past literature and you would see abstracts that were essentially letters, right? You'd find four or five paragraphs, they were 1,250 or 2,000 words and it just got a little ridiculous, right, that these were not abstracts, they were actually, uh, you know, a mini, mini APJ letter <coughs> going in as the abstract. And so the policy currently <coughs> is one paragraph, 250 words, and that is strict 250 words. So 
oftentimes, sometimes people come back, I can't possibly write my abstract in 250 words. Oh, yes, you can. <laughs> so um, occasionally I'll give hints on how to do that. Uh, but people can tell that movie trailer in 250 words. Okay. Then you have the intro. All this happened, more or less, uh, and that is the opening line of a famous Kurt Vonnegut novel. Um, great opening. Uh, and so an introduction says what you are writing about, why the topic is relevant to astronomy and astrophysics. Provide background of the topic with references. It says why your approach offers significant new results. Okay. Uh, and I want to uh, push on that a little bit. And you should not be shy in your introduction. Typically it's done toward the end of the introduction. <clears throat> After you've given some context and background on the topic, explicitly say why what you're doing is a significant new result. This result is novel for three reasons. Boom, boom, boom. And list them in the abstract. So you tell the reader, you tell the referee, you tell the editor explicitly what are the significant new results. Don't leave it for them to guess what the significant new results are or intone what the significant new results are. Don't be shy about saying what it is, okay? Helps a lot. So say what your significant new results are. And good introductions are not necessarily long. It's not a review article, okay? Typically one or two pages that provides only useful information. We don't need to go off on tangents describing uh, things that are related but not directly to the manuscript under consideration. And that's usually sufficient for most topics, okay? Sometimes shorter, sometimes a little longer, but of order one to two pages is usually more than enough to get the job done. All right, and you want to avoid when you're writing your articles, particularly if you've written more than one, um, to avoid self-plagiarism. Oops, can't say that. Uh, text overlap, right? So plagiarism is actually a, a legal, there's a legal definition of uh, plagiarism and it's a crime. And so you don't want to be accusing someone of a crime because um, that has legal implications. So we say text overlap, okay? So don't be cutting and pasting from your past articles and shoving it in, uh, in large chunks. Now, of course, there are only certain ways to say things about a supernova or a galaxy. These are very common descriptions, or if you're describing a hardware instrument, or if you're describing a software instrument. Right? There's usually, sometimes uh, from sponsored research, there's some boilerplate on how to describe the instrument. Okay, this is fine. Uh, this is not what we're looking for of trying to find new ways to say supernovae or describe a, a galaxy. Uh, but you do want to avoid, you know, plucking out entire paragraphs of previous work and hopefully it's your own, um, not somebody else's. That would be uh, an ethical violation. Okay, so try and find new ways. There's lots of fun ways one can say things, so try and find some new ways to say it. So the ideas can be paraphrased, and, uh, but it can't be uh, strictly copied straight over. And I give a link at the bottom of the ethics policy, and I do have a video series on the ethics policies of the AAAS journals. That one's probably ripe for a redo as well. Okay, so the intro. Then we get into the methods, Science 101. And there's really only one basic point I want to get across here in this section of the paper. So you want to give enough information uh, in the methods, the observations, or the experimental section so that someone else could repeat the results. Science 101, replication. Somebody else should be able to pick up uh, and pretty much uh, if they had the, you know, the telescopes and, uh, or the supercomputers or things like that, or oftentimes less, and be able to replicate your results. We've seen lots of uh, recent goings on on this, uh, things around Venus and phosphine, for example. It's a good example of Science 101, right? People trying to replicate a strong result. So you want to give enough information that somebody can do this. Then we get into the we find, the results section, okay? And this is where you're going to extract the science from your data, observational or theory. And you often do this with figures and tables. and Usually, in my experience, uh, this section is often written first. The first thing people do is they get their figures together, they get their tables together, and they start extracting the science out of those figures and tables. So when you do that, you also want to include a discussion of the uncertainties or limitations. Uh, this applies 
both observationally and theoretically. Theorists, you want to put error bars <laughs> on your results uh, or what the limitations of your theory might be. And so the AAS journals uh, also encourages enrichment of articles with uh, things like data behind the figure. So people don't have to digitize the figure. They should be able to click on the figure. And if it's a relatively simple data set, X, Y plot, that kind of thing, boom, up pops the data. Um, other visualizations, interactive figures, and other digital types of assets. So we offer uh, a whole slew of assets to put in your article. Uh, and for those paying attention, you'll probably note that I really try hard <laughs> not to say paper, but to say article, right? Because not many people actually take an article and print it out on physical paper anymore. Usually people read a PDF or they read the web page version. So I try and move away from sort of that um, old -er term of saying paper or papers uh, and use articles. Because with an article, you can do a lot more uh, digital stuff in the modern era than you could ever do on uh, a hard copy paper. Okay. And so there's many examples of this and instructions on how to do this in the URL given below uh, about your manuscript. Okay. And then you have the discussion section. Okay. And so this is where you want to say how the quantitative results that you got relate to the big science questions that you addressed in the introduction. Presumably you gave some big topics in the intro. You've done some detailed stuff and now you want to relate that detailed stuff to the big topic that you're talking about. You want to describe in, in your discussion the advantages of your, of your results and how they compare to previous works, i.e. putting your results in, in context, in perspective with what has gone before. And, you know, good science is predictive, falsifiable, and so you want to describe how your science can be further tested through additional observations, experiments, or calculations. Okay, so this is not an invitation to put in you know, 35 in prep <laughs> citations. Okay, that's not what you want to do. But you do want to give an idea of how somebody else could further test this or falsify uh, this idea or result. Okay, so that usually goes in the discussion section. Finally, or not finally, but you have the conclusion section, and this is usually, most of the time, people write this just before the abstract, because it's usually a bit longer and a bit more detailed than what goes into the abstract. It commonly, but not always, restates the goals, the big science goals in a nutshell. Uh, what observations, experiments, or models uh, you did, briefly. Uh, the main results, with their bars, with limitations. Uh, and what model is or is not supported by your results. Um, and that's usually uh, what goes into a conclusion section. Then we have the acknowledgments, and this is where you get to thank those who helped make your article possible. This could be sponsored funding, very common uh, to see sponsored funding in here. Support staff, telescope support staff, uh, uh, local, local supercomputer support staff, uh, and other researchers that you may have had uh, discussions with uh, that are not co-authors but definitely helped. Uh, help make the article possible. Authors may also want to acknowledge the referee for helping improve their article if they wish. Uh, and currently roughly about 45%, so almost half of articles, oops, I slipped there, there's papers there, articles um, to do so. Okay, uh, so it's a good thing to perhaps think about thanking the referee for improving your article. It is always inappropriate to acknowledge the AAS journal staff, so that would be like the scientific editor, uh, because we are just doing the job that we're supposed to be doing, uh, and plus thanking the scientific editor or otherwise would might give uh, an impression of favoritism or things along those lines, and we definitely don't want to be doing that. So. Uh, do not thank your scientific editor or otherwise in your article in the acknowledgement sections. Then comes the hardware and software thank yous. Uh, so one is facilities. I encourage you to use it because this is how it helps organizations obtain information on the effectiveness of their hardware. This could be telescopes, it could be supercomputers. There's hardware involved and you want to thank uh, those people who made your results possible with that hardware. On the flip side, in addition to hardware, there's also software. Again, slash software, use it. Okay, because the AAS journals recognizes the importance of software 
to the community. Does anybody do any astronomy or astrophysics without software these days? I don't think so. Um, and so there is a need for clear communications about such software, which ensures that credit is given to its authors. Okay? So if you're using software, <laughs> cite it. If you're using hardware, give credit. Okay? And then there's references. Uh, usually, most times, a topic does not begin with your article. Sometimes that's the case, but not usually. And so you want to be as complete as possible in your referencing, and you do not want to excessively self-cite. So, you know, I will get articles coming in that, you know, fully 50% of the references are self-citations, uh, and that usually means either, A, this is such a backwater that nobody else is working in it, that's usually not the case, uh, or you're just being a little uh, selective, right? So even if people are competitors, you should still cite their art, their work, they're still participating in the field, uh, and so you want to be as complete as possible in your references. I highly encourage using a bibliographic reference manager. I'm not going to name any because I don't want to advertise any here, uh, but there are several, um, with an import tool. And the reason you want to do this is that it gives you error-free citations. Usually most of the citations come from ADS, and it also ensures that all citations and only those citations are resolved. Okay, so we don't end up with the problem of things that are in the reference list that are not cited in the article or vice versa, things that are cited in the article but not in the reference list. So you can completely eliminate those gaps by using a bibliographic reference manager and an import tool. So now your manuscript is ready and you go ahead and submit your manuscript. And when you do, you will be asked which corridor does it go down? There are seven corridors, and currently seven corridors in the Double Edge journals. So we have Galaxies and Cosmology, that's currently headed up by Chris Consolis, the High Energy Phenomena and Fundamental Physics Corridor. We have Stars and Stellar Physics, headed up by Steve Kowaler. We have the Solar System, Exoplanets and Astrobiology, headed up currently by Michael Endel. We have the Interstellar Matter and the Local Universe, Judy Pfeiffer. Uh, the Sun and the Heliosphere by Leon Golub. And then we have the mouthful, instrumentation, software, laboratory, astrophysics, and data, Crystal and Todd. And sometimes articles will cross different corridors, and that's perfectly fine. Uh, usually the, the lead editors, if there is such an article, will have a discussion. Uh, and it's okay. We will um, move articles between corridors as it's appropriate. Um, but you will have to pick one as you first go in. Now your article is submitted. And you await the referee report, perhaps with some popcorn. So I want to talk a little bit about that referee process from the perspective of, of an author, uh, how it goes through. Okay. So <clears throat> the peer review process from the perspective of an author. So the goal of the sometimes intense review process is to improve a manuscript and arrive at publication. Okay to improve a manuscript and arrive at publication. Okay, keep repeating yourself to that, okay? The acceptance rate for the AAS journals is about 85%, and thus the review process should be viewed as constructive. And I will talk about that 85% in a bit, um, but I'll say it real briefly here before we get into some of it. So roughly 5%. Uh, do not enter the peer review process. And I'll talk about why that is the case. Roughly 5% uh, get abandoned at the first revision. In other words, it goes through the peer review process, there's a report generated, and the authors just never come back. Um, <clears throat> okay, uh, so that's about 5%. And then you have about 5% that uh, end up being rejected. Okay, but 85% <clears throat> in general uh, go through the process. Okay, so we receive roughly about 100 new submissions each week, <clears throat> and that arrival rate, <coughs> excuse me, correlates with uh, grant proposal deadlines, academic calendars, um, you know, everybody like, seems like everybody likes to get a, uh, a new article in before the end of the uh, uh, calendar year, uh, and so the, um, 
the Christmas January time frame is usually quite busy people also like to submit articles before they will go on a summer break and so uh, that period is pretty busy um, both in the northern and southern hemisphere so it flips you know back and forth and various various holidays on shorter time scales there's also uh, something on, you know referred to as the Monday effect uh, because people will work on it over the weekends and they submit and so Mondays always tend to be um, a, quite a bit busier with new submissions and revisions as it comes in. So some new submissions are stopped at the gate <coughs> and they are not sent out for peer review. So this is part of the 5% and these uh, are usually, uh, it's a perfectly fine science article, there's nothing wrong with it. Uh, it's just appropriate for another science journal and not to pick on anything uh, but just to give you a concrete example for so for example I will get plasma physics manuscripts and it's a perfectly great plasma physics uh, article but it doesn't apply its results directly to astrophysical systems so go back to the metric right significant new results apply directly to astrophysical systems and so it's a great piece of science but uh, it's not applied to astronomy or astrophysics and so um, those get the out of scope <coughs> message. Uh, as I repeated a couple times, we do not do comment or review manuscripts, so those do come in somebody, and by comment I mean somebody usually complaining about somebody else's article. <laughs> um, okay, uh, so always encourage them to write a new article where they put in their own significant new results, and then in the con putting their significant new results in context, yes, you can talk about other other articles that's perfectly fine that's part of science uh, but we don't do just you know complaining about something else that was published uh, and then occasionally you do get uh, manuscripts that are not suitable for publication in any science journal um, yeah the crank papers <laughs> the crank submissions uh, so those don't go out for peer review either <coughs> So manuscripts that clear this bar, that they do enter the peer review process, are then checked, as I mentioned, with a text overlap tool. Uh, we use cross-check, uh, and it gives some score, and you always have to go through that score and see what that score constitutes uh, and what's in there. Uh, a lot of times it'll pick up, there is a habit of authors submitting to archive at the same time they submit or shortly thereafter. And so cross-check will pick up the archive version uh, and so the percentage looks high but it's okay because what you submit on archive is doesn't matter to the peer review process sort of <laughs> um, but we do look and then manuscripts with a statistical component are often previewed by the AAS statistics editor and manuscripts with a software or data component are often previewed by the AAS data editors and all of this right here is all aimed at scientific integrity okay it's a value add for the AAS journals that we have a statistics editor that we have a data editor that will look through these things and so these are uh, uh, value added to your article in improving the article and bringing it to publication one of about 25 <coughs> science editors is then assigned who has a couple of duties. One is to choose the referee or referees. Uh, one is the norm, although things like the Planetary Science Journal, two, is mandated. We have some fields where two referees is the norm. Laboratory astrophysics, for example, will generally go with two referees. And I would say in my own work, roughly 10, 15% will end up with two referees right off the bat on the initial, um, initial report. Uh, the scientific editor also then supervises the, the peer review process, adjudicates any impasses that may occur, and makes the final accept, reject decision. Okay, so the scientific editor makes the decision. The scientific editor is expected to have a general knowledge of the subject of the manuscript and it is the referee who is expected to be an expert in the particular subfield. Okay, so who is these experts, referees? So we consider every publishing author worldwide or an international journal as a potential referee. And so we're looking for a subject matter expert who is usually at the post-PhD level. 
And then we have a number of things that we look at, which are all can be sort of generally categorized in the objectivity concern. So we don't want to look for previous co-authors uh, who have worked with the authors in the recent past. Uh, that's the family and friends plan. Uh, not someone from the same institution. That's a problem, obviously. Someone down the door, down the hall is, is uh, the referee. That doesn't work. <clears throat> uh, not someone who is known to be a mortal enemy. Uh, every field has its sometimes protagonists who like to beat on each other. Uh, and so we try and avoid that minefield if possible. Uh, not someone who's known to be a close personal friend. That's known to be a close personal friend. Uh, again, that's the family and friends plan. And of course, uh, we don't know everything. We don't know who was a grad student of who, who postdoc with who, who may be friends with who. And so potential referees are expected to reveal potential conflicts of interest when you're asked to be a referee. Um, so, you know, if you get a request to be a referee and the article is headed up by your ex postdoc, you should say so. Uh, and things along those lines. Uh, so those are who we look at for the referee. And I just want to make a comment that securing a referee can take a while. Number one, we're all busy. Uh, and a quality report takes time. And I do have a video on, on how to be a good referee. And I'll put that uh, link in the description below the video. And sometimes specialized manuscripts um, that could either have very small communities uh, can be a challenge to find a referee for because, uh, you know, three, four people and they all know each other and that can be a little, a little tough. Uh, and on the other hand, uh, you have very large collaboration manuscripts that can consume most of the community. Uh, you can think LIGO, gravitational waves, LIGO Virgo, gravitational waves, uh, cosmic rays, uh, you know, Ice Cube is a, is a pretty big one, um, and there are others. So those can also be a little bit of a challenge to find referee reports. So be patient, be patient. So when a potential referee does not accept the invitation, it is helpful if potential referees are suggested. So if you get asked and for whatever reason you can't do it, that's okay, it's fine. It's always great if you suggest other experts um, who might be able to take it. We do keep a database on authors and referees who have served as a referee, when, on which subject, the length of time it took them to do the reports, and so on. <clears throat> and this is to help uh, us so that you know, you're not choosing somebody who um, uh, takes forever to get a report in or accepts and then finally never ever submits the report, so that's bad. <clears throat> and although the, so, although the peer review process uh, can be a little time consuming and difficult, uh, I would say that scientists have an obligation to participate in that process. And uh, particularly, you know, if you're submitting papers to the AAAS journals and the community is taking the time and effort to review and report on your submissions, you should help play the game and be willing to referee on papers. And again, I've got a discussion on that in the referees. So help play the game, please, people. Okay. So our goal is to receive the referee report on your submission within three weeks of securing a reviewer. Within securing a reviewer. Do not confuse this three weeks with the submission date. It's perfectly fine to ask the scientific editor on the status of your manuscript. That's great. Uh, but try not to be that person that, uh, you know, one minute after three weeks when it was submitted saying, where's my report? <laughs> okay. Be a little patient. It's three weeks of securing a referee, which can take some time on occasion. The scientific editor can also edit the referee report or the author reply uh, for correcting obvious typos, personal attacks, that's a no-no, bombast, gender neutrality, etc. Uh, so they can and do edit the reports as need be uh, when these kind of things occur. It's not common, but it does happen. Referees are anonymous by default. If a referee wishes to waive anonymity and the scientific editor agrees with that, then uh, direct correspondence between the author and the referee is forbidden. We always have to have the journals, the scientific editor in that loop of communication because ultimately it's the scientific editor who has to make that decision. Okay? And experience shows 85% that the author and referee interaction is usually positive and constructive. Okay, so keep that in mind. Okay, 
So now, after all this, <clears throat> you, the author, the lead author, gets the report. Receiving a report. Relax. 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 Okay. Read the report carefully. If a report contains some critical comments, take a few days to cool off. Okay? You have six months to revise and reply. Okay? Firing off an angry response within an hour is rarely useful. Okay? But I still get them. <laughs> um, so don't do that. Right? The report was written in, in good faith, usually. Um, and so don't don't get all angry and fire off some nasty message to the scientific editor. It's not helpful. Because if a referee misinterprets a point, it is not necessarily their fault. Okay, you may not have explained it as clearly as you think you did. Right, the, a common one when I get these angry responses. You know, the referee clearly did not read my paper. Well, yes, they did. <laughs> That's how they wrote the report. Uh, but they may not have gotten a point because you didn't explain it well enough. So keep it in perspective. And also remind yourself of the goal of the review process, right? To improve a manuscript and arrive at publication. To improve a manuscript. So remind yourself this is what the purpose of the referee report is to improve your manuscript, okay? And it can also be helpful just from a human perspective is, you know, have a sense of humor. Uh, it's often useful to do so. This is a game we choose to play, um, and it's a human endeavor, and so have a little humor about your fellow humans as we go through this. And relax. It's a referee report. Okay. So reviewers, after you've digested the report and you're going to revise, reviewers find it helpful when those changes in a revised manuscript are easily distinguishable. Okay, so you want to mark changes. You can use colored fonts. It's very popular. Bold font is also very popular. Or use the markup commands in the AAS uh, markup package. Okay, but gone are the days <clears throat> when you submit a revised manuscript and, you know, oh, we changed this, 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 and this. And then the reviewer or the editor has to go in this pecking trying to find out exactly where you put it in this, you know, all black font. Uh, text. So make it easy for the reviewer and the editor to find the changes that you said you did. <clears throat> Do not submit one version with the markup and one version without the markup. Now I've got two manuscripts and this can only lead to confusion. Okay, The markup is easily removed after the review process. Uh, so one reason why you don't want to submit one with markup and one without is it opens up the possibility of gaps. Okay. So we say we change A, uh, and in the colored markup it is there, but then in the one without the markup it isn't there. And so you can end up with these gaps uh, and just completely don't do that. <laughs> just submit one version of the manuscript with markup. Okay. And so when you also resubmit a manuscript, uh, you want to include a detailed listing of the changes that you've made to your text in responses to particular items raised in the report. Okay. Uh, and now we're going to do some Brazilian Jiu Jitsu. So this is some stuff for uh, authors to consider that is to your tactical advantage. So this is Brazilian Jiu Jitsu in the martial art of publication. And for those uh, who may have been around a little bit, yes, the martial art of publication um, is a nod to uh, an article by the same name. Uh, of Eugene Parker. So, number one, as we've talked about, editors make decisions. Reviewers provide input to that decision. Who do you want to talk to? Okay, I'm going to presume you want to talk to the scientific editor since they're making the decision. So, in your reply letter, you want to formally address your reply to the editor. Dear doctor, name of scientific editor. As you, as you respond, you want to depersonalize your reply, okay? So you want to use things like the report instead of the referee, because you, as soon as you say the referee, okay, now you're pointing at someone, and whether you agree, disagree, doesn't matter, but you, you're 
You want to take that personalization out. And so always refer, the report says, the report does this, the report does that. Not what the referee says, what the report says. Okay, so this will help depersonalize your reply. It'll also, also help you write a more neutral response uh, if the report was a little critical. So always say the report. You want to shy away from saying an item in a report is long, is wrong, uh, unless you enjoy really long, drawn-out review processes. <laughs> okay, so so you want to be positive, give the right answer, uh, and put these improvements in the revised manuscript. Okay, but guaranteed, if you come in and you say you are, you make it personal, and you say something like the referee is wrong. Well, okay, now we're going to go down. A, fairly long process because nobody likes to be told directly that they're wrong so uh, be a little smoother than that I guess is how I would phrase it <clears throat> the goal of your reply is to reach closure okay you want to reach the point where the scientific editor will make a decision so and again it's in the name of being positive you want to include a line somewhere some people put it up at the top some people put it at the bottom but you know we hope our manuscript can now be accepted for publication and then finally, because you are writing a formal reply to the scientific editor, you want to close it by including your name. Okay? If it's a big collaboration, usually it's the lead author uh, you know, for the X collaboration or uh, your name for all the authors or something like that. And sometimes people will put in all the authors uh, at the bottom, uh, which also helps that all the co-authors have actually approved the changes to the manuscript. Um, so these are things you can do to your advantage okay, as an author. <clears throat> so closure, speaking of, is usually reached after two or three referee iterations with time scales of a few months, and most of that time scale is driven by the length of time it takes authors uh, to revise a manuscript. I would say typically, depending on the report, but typically uh, about six weeks is a good time to put in that first revision. It's a long enough time to at least give the impression <laughs> that you've seriously considered the report. And oftentimes it does take that long just to reply to, to give a quality reply to referee report. Um, uh, you know, if it's a more smaller report, uh, you know, you can go quicker. Um, there are some cases where you do have six months to reply and sometimes authors do take that six months. So. Um, that's usually what, what drives the time scale for closure. So in the case of a stalemate, a scientific editor may seek a second referee on their own, or they will grant the author's request for a second referee, uh, or simply just make a decision. Um, uh, and I'll throw one in here. Sometimes when authors get a report that is a little critical, the very first thing they do is they fire off a message to the scientific editor saying, we want a second referee. Uh, and generally the answer to that is no. <laughs> um, there were valid scientific points raised and you should address those. And not choosing, you know, not to deal with the referee report sort of smacks of referee shopping around. Well, give me another one until I get something positive. It's no, no, no. Time and effort was invested in providing a quality report. You should address it. Okay. If a second referee sought the second referee's um, almost always ask for an independent review. I'm not looking for them to adjudicate the previous report. That's my job, <laughs> okay? But to give me a new independent report. And sometimes that new referee is informed about what the nature of what the impasse was um, from the first set of peer reviews with the first reviewer. And scientific editors serve as arbitrators, mediators, and eventually judges in an evolved, or in any actually, peer review process. Okay. And so now you're one of those 85% and you may celebrate. Woohoo! Your article is accepted for publication in the AAS journals. Awesome. You're now a published or another published article in the APJ, APJ Letters, Supplement, AJ, Planetary Science Journal. Hooray. Okay. Uh, and not only that, where you get to celebrate that your article is accepted, but sometimes uh, your article may be highlighted in the AAS Nova uh, or on the AAS YouTube channel, which you're watching here. Uh, and there's plenty of examples of that uh, where you can see author, uh, author chats or they're chatting about their article, they'll walk through it. Uh, and those are always really great. 
So thank you very much, and we'll see you on the next one. Bye-bye.